And welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. And I'm inviting you to visit us at naturalnurse.com where you can send us an email. You can also visit Facebook, The Natural Nurse. And we have so many classes and workshops coming up. Many people contact us who think a good thing to do might be to move towards having a way to earn a living in natural health. And certainly I agree, that's something that can definitely be done. And we have a class coming up called Career Paths in Natural Health, where we go into that in great detail. We also have that available privately, so we actually look at your resume and then talk about what you can do directly for the least amount of money and the least amount of time to have a career or in a profession in natural. So that's something you can join us for. However, in terms of creating your own herbal products, let's say, you go outside and you make some dandelion uh, wine or dandelion tincture and everyone loves it and you say, wow, this would be a good thing to do perhaps uh, and make some money and sell it. That, we have a class coming up right away uh, called Herbal Manufacturing Legal Considerations. And that's one where I definitely recommend strongly that you know before you go. Because although you might think it's just, you know, an easy little thing and I'll just make some herbal tinctures and I'll sell them and then I'll sell them on Etsy and then I'll put them on Amazon. Um, I have several clients right now, I mean hundreds, um, who actually are dealing with the FDA and the FTC. And they had no idea they would get into such hot water just by doing something that sounds, uh, you know, very uh, nice. Just sell a little dandelion tincture on Etsy. I'm telling you, don't do it. That is the recommendation. If you do want to do it or you even want to find out about it, immediately take our class called Herbal Manufacturing Legal Considerations. You can find it at naturalnurse.com calendar because you want to know before you go. We also have a great class coming up, one of my favorite, because it's the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification course. And this is the least costly way to take this class. You can take it anytime, but if you take it in this group class, of course, it's much less per person. And it grants 18 CEU credits if you need them. If you don't need CEUs, you don't have to take those, but if you are either an RN, an NP, an RD, or a licensed massage therapist, or a licensed acupuncturist, you can take this class and get 18 CEUs. So you can also find it at naturalnurse.com calendar, and that's coming up. We're taking registration now. Um, and you can use it towards your RH. What is an RH, you might ask? Well, an RH, is a registered herbalist, and it is the most recognized herbal certification in the United States. So if you would like to become an herbalist, or if you're already calling yourself an herbalist and you're doing, let's say, consults with other people, it's a very good idea, highly recommended, to become an RH. And I do mentoring so that someone can become an RH, but many other people do as well. You want to look into it and we have a whole class in that and all the natural nurse herbal certification class credits are also useful towards an rh we also have a class that's free called iron what you need to know about the strength mineral you know there's a lot that you might not know about iron like what foods has it what makes it be absorbed more efficiently what makes it um, be difficult to absorb what might deplete it what issues, health issues, may be linked to either too much, too much also, or too little. So we have a full class on iron coming up as well. So check out the website, naturalnurse.com. There's a lot there. We also have um, archives for our wonderful radio shows here on Progressive Radio Network. We have links to them. And we also have thousands of totally free articles that you can access there as well as many other services. 
So check it out, naturalnurse.com. Calendar is a good place to start for the classes. Today, we are very, very happy to have a wonderful guest on board, and that is Dr. Matthew Budoff. He is a medical doctor, professor of medicine at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. That means he got up early to join us this morning. Thank you, doctor. And he is the endowed chair of preventive cardiology at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He's going to talk to us today about heart health, and he has been the lead researcher on numerous studies showing the healing powers of a specific vegetable, which we will go into. In fact, there are 4,525 studies that can be found at the National Library of Medicine um, showing it can be used successfully to treat more than 150 chronic diseases, including infections like viral infections, as well as heart disease. So thank you so much for um, being on board today as our guest, Dr. Matthew J. Budoff. It's coming in good. Thank you. Listen, you're far away and I'm far away and it's amazing we can all do this together at Progressive Radio Network uh, with technology. Now, when we're talking about treating a disease with a natural remedy, since you are a physician, and certainly a highly trained and honored physician, are you allowed to use that word even though we're not talking about a drug? Because in, in uh, marketing, you are not allowed to use the word treat. Oh uh, yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, in the world now where we're using a lot of complementary therapies, um, I think a lot of doctors are, 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 you know, using these therapies, and although they're not uh, approved by the FDA, we're still allowed to, pres you know, to prescribe them or, or to uh, uh, recommend them uh, and, and call it treatment uh, from a physician standpoint. We can't, we just can't advertise that way. Oh, that's interesting. So if someone comes to you and you are certainly, you know, a, a board certified cardiologist, you could actually tell someone or even write it on a prescription pad to take a specific kind of aged garlic for a disease process that they have. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's fantastic. So I imagine a nurse practitioner or anyone, not myself, I'm a nurse, I'm a PhD RN, but I don't have prescribing privileges because of that. NPs do, like nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and certainly someone like yourself. So that's interesting because someone I'm working with, she's been able, here in Broward County where I am in Florida, she actually runs six walk-in clinics that are part of the Broward County hospital system. And she herself is very involved in promoting natural therapies as well as pharmaceuticals when needed. And she has been able to bring certain natural products into the pharmacy in those locations. So she can, like you're saying, write a prescription for using something like aged garlic and have it dispensed and covered by health insurance via the pharmacy in the clinic. Well, that's great. Yeah. No, I think that that's probably regional and, and uh, you know, there'll be a little bit of, I would imagine, hit or miss there, but, but I think that's going to become a growing trend. Yes, it's an exciting growing trend where a knowledgeable physician like yourself can actually, not that you wouldn't maybe also use a pharmaceutical for someone, it doesn't eliminate that, although it certainly may cut down on the use of pharmaceuticals because if people change their diet and lifestyle and start exercising and eating right, and using something like aged garlic, they may actually not have to use as many pharmaceuticals. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I use them uh, a lot to reduce the burden of uh, traditional medications in my patients. Okay, so to use the word traditional, just to clarify, so to use the word traditional, <clears throat> let's talk about things that have been around for thousands of years, like garlic, and aged garlic, that would be a traditional remedy. But I, I believe you're sharing that you would also use, when needed, conventional medication. Yes, yes. 
So that is fantastic. What got you involved in being the lead researcher on numerous studies showing the healing power of garlic and in particular aged garlic? Well, you know, uh, it was probably over a decade ago, I, I approached uh, Wakunaga, a company that makes uh, this aged garlic. And I, I told them that I was reading a, a lot about their uh, successful studies with high blood pressure and cholesterol. And I wanted to see if the therapy worked to reduce plaque build up in the heart, uh, you know, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Um, so, so they decided to fund a research study. And we started doing clinical research to, to see what the effect of aged garlic would be on the coronary arteries. So did you use as a control by any chance regular unaged garlic? No, we used placebo in the early trials uh, because we had a limited number of patients and we just wanted to see if garlic in general and aged garlic in specific uh, as the traditional therapy could could help us in in a disease state that only had conventional medicine studied uh, up to date up to that time point we hadn't really explored too many of these uh, uh, traditional therapies uh, at that point that's very groundbreaking and excellent so what was the outcome so we showed that it it reduced a uh, 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 plaque buildup, it slowed atherosclerosis in the arteries. Um, and then what we did is we, because it was a small study, we embarked on a larger trial um, with more patients in it to really validate the early findings. And that also showed the same thing, that if patients who were taking the aged garlic extract, um, this kyolic product, um, were uh, uh, had a lower rate of, of buildup of, of plaque in their arteries um, as compared to those people who were not, uh, who were just taking the placebo tablet. So that is fascinating. Now in this, I know you believe as someone trained in preventive and lifestyle medicine, you believe in more or less also doing other integrative therapies such as dietary and lifestyle recommendations. But did you do that in these trials or just eat whatever you want as normal? You know, we tried to give both groups, uh, all the patients, uh, some good dietary advice. Um, it wasn't an intervention of diet, so we just kind of tried to give them an equal amount of dietary advice on either side. But we did want everybody to be eating well overall. So they, they basically both had good diets, both groups. Absolutely, yes. So both groups had had uh, uh, good dietary prescriptions. Um, they, they met with uh, my nurse uh, who, who talked with them about diet once at the beginning of the study, um, but that was the only part of the dietary intervention. So diet okay. was balanced, so it was good diet. And then we added aged garlic or, or placebo and then followed them for one year. Oh, that's really great for a whole year. Yeah, so we had now long-term data on blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, as well as uh, buildup of, of uh, heart disease in the arteries. So that's very powerful. That is a very powerful outcome to show something like that, because what are the adverse effects of that particular intervention? So, yeah, so uh, um, the really, uh, this is very well tolerated. When you take uh, garlic and you age it, so this product is aged, it takes away a lot of the toxins. It takes away a lot of the odor. It makes it uh, much uh, easier to, to, for patients to ingest. So there's less stomach problems. There's less, there's no odor. Your, your significant other is not gonna mind you being on aged garlic because you're not gonna smell like a garlic clove. Um, and uh, it really was very well tolerated uh, in the clinical trials. You know, that's exciting, and I've heard about this for you. This is not brand new. Um, what year did you first do those first initial studies? So the, our early studies were done um, probably at least 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit longer. I think around 2008, uh, we did our original trials with, with aged garlic. And, you know, you would think that this would become, like, like what I told you, my friend who's the nurse practitioner here, integrating these therapies truly into standard of practice in mainstream medicine. So it is the first go-to 
instead of the last go-to. Correct. Yeah. So um, it'll it'll continue to evolve. We've had you know three more trials that we've done over the past decade. So we've really been able to help validate a lot of this um, to to demonstrate to doctors who are more skeptical about traditional therapies. Um, that this does have a, a nice effect and an important effect to, to reduce uh, heart disease. And hopefully that'll continue to build um, as, they, as they look towards uh, therapies outside of uh, what we've learned about in medical school and in our conventional uh, ar array of, of medications. But do you think there's pushback, let's say, particularly from the pharmaceutical companies about this kind of transition? Because it seems like the patients don't lose out, the doctors don't lose out, but, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, I would say, do. Yeah, I think right now it's probably too small a percentage of their business for, the, for it to really um, have them going, you know, trying to think about this. I think that they are going, you know, they typically compete with each other for for the attentions of doctors and patients uh ads on tv ads on, on radio uh you know a lot of doctor interactions um so i think right now they're still they're still you know going after each other and saying instead of taking statin number two you should take my my cholesterol medicine because it's better um so um, hopefully we'll we'll rise to the to their attention at some point it'll become a a, a large enough uh uh market that that it'll rise to the attention of the pharmaceutical industry well since i am so thrilled to have you on the show and we're talking today with dr matthew budoff and um you know he's well versed in what we're talking about today which is the use of aged garlic specifically for treating various illnesses and i'm so happy to have you on board today what would be a medication that might compete for the same action that you might use the aged garlic for. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, right now we're, we're some people don't need to go on the statins, uh, torvastatin or uh, uh, simvastatin, uh, the drugs that help lower cholesterol because we get some of that effect from garlic. Now, I have to say that, you know, if they have very significant abnormalities or if they've already suffered a heart attack or, or a stroke that, that I use this um, in addition to those other therapies, not to replace those other therapies. You know, we call it complementary medicine. Um, uh, we add it to uh, our, our, our more conventional therapies that are proven um, in, in, you know, larger trials that I've been able to do with garlic, but it is a nice supplement in that, in that population for patients who are healthier, who don't yet need a statin, I think this is a wonderful therapy to help uh, lower cholesterol, get the blood pressure under control, and we know now slow the buildup of heart disease in the coronary arteries. I think that's incredibly exciting because when you look at the, you know, the risk-benefit ratio, the adverse effect profile, which is close to zero, I imagine somebody could be allergic. I mean, you can't eliminate that totally, but in general, um, you get an awful lot of positive aspects for very minimum risk ratio. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That is just very exciting. Now, let me ask you something off topic. I don't, it's a little bit off topic. Um, and perhaps you have seen in the news that this is something new, like this week or so. And you don't have, to, if you haven't looked into it, that's fine also, um, Dr. Budoff. But there was a, a whole, article about eating eggs and how it vastly increased early death rate. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm familiar with a lot of the uh, data on eggs. I don't know if I've seen that most recent study. Okay. What, what is your feelings about it, though? Well, you know, I think in moderation, eggs have a lot of proteins and eggs have a lot of uh, of good nutrients, but right, like but choline think, is, is is very yeah, high in eggs, exactly. Absolutely, and there's a lot of essential um, vitamins and proteins. Um, essential means that you have to get it from your diet. So I think that generally eggs are are uh, are, are good, but uh, again, I try to moderate my patients to make sure that they don't they don't overdo it. I don't think they want to have you know multiple eggs every day, for example. 
So what do you think a reasonable quantity would be? I think having eggs twice a week uh, is probably reasonable, um, um, just in general. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you're finding other, other breakfasts and other, other, other foods uh, on other days. Um, so, you know, my dad I grew did... up on eggs right. and bacon every day, uh -huh. uh, you know, and that's probably a little too much. Well, how, how did he do? Uh, well, I mean, early on he did okay. He ended up uh, with heart disease, and I don't know if that was only diet related. He had other medical things, but I think you probably don't. I, I'm not a big advocate of, of daily egg consumption, but I think uh, you know a, a few times a week is is very reasonable. Because that was one of my quotes. My dad, who passed away last year, 94 and very healthy. It was like never age. It was like <sighs> fine, 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 fine. Driving, dancing, drinking, playing pool. And then goodbye that same day, you know, with no period of, of senility, no period of being an old person. He ate eggs every day. I'm just saying. Yeah. No, I mean, it's certain some people tolerate different things uh, better, but uh, I think moderation is probably uh, probably key. I don't think you that want is to... always good advice. But you know, it's so interesting when we read studies, and I know you are an expert at that thing, as you've done so many, that when you read in the news these headlines, but then you actually dive deep and read the study itself, um, sometimes the headlines, like this particular one about eggs, um, really it looked, it was like a longitudinal study where they looked back a meta-analysis study on the fact that these people had high cholesterol and had, you know, um, an earlier time that they were passing away. But it, it seemed like a stretch to link it specifically to the egg ingestion. Other yeah, than I mean, the there's question, so yeah. many things that go into diet and uh, lifestyle and risk and, and genetics. Um, you know, your dad obviously had good genetics and lived a very healthy life. Oh, and Not also everybody exercise, does that yeah. well. He exercised every day, you know, and he right. was trim. Right. And so I think did. whenever you try to focus on one thing, like eggs, unless it's randomized, where you, you tell one group you're going to eat eggs every day and another group you're not, I think that you get the wrong answer sometimes when it comes to, to those type of interventions. So we're going to take a little break here, um, doctor. Just fascinating information. But before we go, what is the best follow-up after today's show for people to find out more about all the information that you're sharing here? Yeah, I mean, I, I always... Uh, we send them over to kyolic.com, K-Y-O-L-I-C.com. They have a, a thousands of articles uh, there referenced, and uh, really uh, they can get a lot of information about uh, the aged garlic that we studied. Excellent. That's what we will send out. So we're going to take a little break right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z, and this is Ellen Kamai, The Natural Nurse at naturalnurse.com. And when we come back, we will continue our conversation with our fascinating guest today, Dr. Matthew Budoff. We will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. On this edition of The Natural Medicine Chest, we'll discuss the nutrient known as taurine. Amino acids are chemical constituents that form the building blocks of protein in the body. The official definition of an amino acid is a compound which contains an amino group and a carboxylic acid. Taurine contains a sulfonic group instead, so is not a true amino acid, although it is often referred to as one. The intracellular concentration of taurine is 10 times that of any normal free amino acid. Taurine was discovered in 1827, but the significance of taurine in nutrition was not realized until 1975, when the journal Science published a study showing that taurine-deficient cats suffered from retinal degeneration. In 1986, the Annual Review of Biochemistry reported that the amount of taurine present in mammalian milk depends on the species. Natural human mother's milk is rich in taurine, but cow's milk, except for the early milk known as colostrum, is taurine deficient. Pediatrics Journal in 1983 printed a study which outlined several of the biologically significant functions of taurine, and an effort was then made to fortify infant formula by adding taurine. Some species of animals, such as cats, cannot synthesize taurine within their bodies, and so must receive it through their diets. 
Humans have a very limited ability to synthesize taurine, so adequate intake through diet and supplementation is important. The principal source of dietary taurine is meat of various types and shellfish. Even people ingesting sufficiently high levels of taurine may develop a deficiency due to the overgrowth of certain anaerobic intestinal microorganisms which consume taurine. Certain prescription drugs are known inhibitors of taurine uptake. The Journal of Neurochemistry published a study in 1975 which showed that taurine concentrations are extremely high in the retina. In fact, the retina contains two binding proteins specific for taurine. Research has yet to determine exactly how taurine functions in the eye, but deficiency of taurine has been found to lead to the degeneration of photoreceptor cells. Continued studies on taurine have linked its presence to several biological functions, besides being a protector of the delicate tissues of the eye. Taurine helps to neutralize oxidizing agents caused by ionizing radiation. Taurine is present in high concentrations in the normal heart. It stimulates white blood cell motility and protects cell membranes from free radical damage. Taurine has proven useful in epileptics to reduce or control seizures. It helps modulate the transport of substances such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, copper, and iron across cell membranes. Additional research supports taurine's role in preventing gallstones. So, as you can see, the nutrient taurine may be an important addition to your natural medicine chest. And welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Please visit us at naturalnurse.com. Click on calendar to find out all the classes and workshops that you can join in on. Go to radio shows for links to uh, hundreds, literally many hundreds of shows that we have done right here on Progressive Radio Network. And I'd like to welcome back our guest today, Dr. Matthew Budoff. Dr. Budoff is professor of medicine at David Geffen School of Medicine in UCLA and the endowed chair of preventive cardiology at Harvard UC Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Dr. Budoff, that is a pretty, um, pretty uh, top-notch kind of title. You are the chair of preventive cardiology. What do we mean by preventive cardiology in that context? Yeah, so I work with a lot of patients um, early in their, um, when they identify that they have a risk factor for heart disease and try to work to, to prevent them from ever suffering that first heart attack or stroke. You know, so many patients present to me after their heart attack and the, the damage is done, the heart is weakened. And then we, you know, we try to apply therapies to prolong their life, but, but there is some, some years of life that are lost when you suffer a heart attack, even if you survive it, you just, people don't tend to live as long after a heart attack. So I work to prevent the first uh, heart attack um, um, whenever, whenever possible uh, uh, and work with my patients in that context. So in prevention, what kind of testing do you do? Would it be the normal cardiovascular panel or is there any additional things you might be looking at? You know, so I do what's called a calcium score. It's a heart, it's a, it's not a, it's not, it doesn't measure calcium in the blood. It measures buildup of cal calcifications or plaque in the, in the arteries around the heart. Um, and if I find that they have early heart disease before their heart attack, I can be more aggressive with both conventional and traditional therapies, uh, as well as lifestyle to try to, you know, forego or, or forestall um, a potential uh, heart attack that may be that they may be suffering uh, or may may have a problem with in the future. Well, I had a test. I don't know if it's the same one that you're talking about, but I request it because doctors don't normally do that, where they actually do a sonogram around the heart and also of the carotid and inguinal arteries every year to look for potential plaque buildup. Yeah, that's a similar test, a little different than the one that I do, but mine uses a CT scanner, not a, a ultrasound, but, but a very similar kind of prevention where you can identify people who have early uh, um, buildup of, of disease, and then, and then we, can, we can make a plan to go after it uh, with the patient and, and their, their other physicians if necessary. That just makes such total sense. Now, in terms of um, visual and, and billing, 
certainly a CT scan, you're going to get much better definition than with a sonogram. However, the cost factor and the ease of doing it, I'm just thinking in terms of more widespread, like part of everyone's physical, let's say every two or three years, wouldn't it be good to initiate that kind of, even if we just use the sonogram initially? Yeah, I think you can do either one. I mean, there are a lot of hospital systems that have the CT scanners. Um, most places charge about $100 for the CT of the heart to look at the, the arteries. But you're right. I mean, I think, you know, you can t you can use both approaches and try to uh, or either approach and try to identify who's at risk and then get them on the road of recovery. So why don't we as as a professional physician? Why isn't that just a mainstream screening? Um, you know, it's slowly being incorporated into the guidelines for traditional medic for, for the uh, uh, for the conventional physicians and the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association are now advocating it. But it's it's been a long road. It's been a, a battle for really my whole career to try to get them to to use this test. You know, we screen for cancer. Uh, we don't screen for heart disease and heart disease kills more people every year than all cancers combined. So. People just need to recognize that. I mean, even even with COVID, twice as many people last year died of a heart attack or stroke than of, of co coronavirus, even though all we heard in the news was, was coronavirus. So it's still taking an incredible toll on our population, and people need to recognize that. So that is so, um, that is so excellent. That is really so excellent that you have been initiating looking at that testing um, for so many years and that you're working towards making it be a standard of practice like medicare should cover that i would think yes and and i we've gotten it covered in now some places but yes medicare needs to cover it and and uh, blue cross and united healthcare and all the big players in this in this country need to start covering this this scan and we're getting there and we're working through each insurance company one by one um, to advocate for it because early early information will allow people um, and their providers to to um, you know do something about it this is a, a reversible process you can you can stop heart disease before it before it, it kills people I know that's so amazing. I always follow Dr. Dean Ornish's early work with this as well. And you're, what you're saying is so important. Like, not only can you prevent it, you can actually reverse it. Absolutely. Yep. And, no, and then very big believer that. Kaolic garlic could be part of that whole regimen, um, along with the early testing and just much more emphasis on true prevention. It's really exciting with this work that you've been doing. So what about garlic and the heart? What is, what is uh, let's say, the chemicals involved or what's going on with the heart health benefit of garlic that is, are often overlooked? Yeah, you know, so, um, you know, garlic, as you mentioned uh, when you opened your show, um, that garlic has been around for, for you know, really millennia. Um, it's not a new product, um, and it's probably been been a very useful tool in our battle against things like heart disease and infection uh, for for all of this time. Uh, people who ingest more garlic, like the Mediterranean diet, tend to tend to have less heart disease. So I think we had a lot of indirect proof, and then doing randomized trials where we just give them garlic or a placebo, we can then pinpoint the exact benefit. And for garlic. Uh, what we did is we were able to show that it, it slows down and in our most recent study reverses some of the heart disease. So just like Dean Ornish was able to do that with a, you know, a, a more comprehensive regimen, garlic was able to reverse heart disease um, uh, over the course of one year. And when you're saying garlic, was there an additional positive aspect if we use the aged garlic? Yeah, well, that was, yeah, so we used the aged, excuse me, yeah, we used the aged garlic, and we used a higher dose. We used, instead of normally uh, people would take two capsules a day is what's the, you know, the recommended dose on the bottle, which is 1,200 milligrams, we were giving people 2,400 milligrams, and we showed that there was some reversal of heart disease um, when you go to the higher dose, uh, but wow. that's with aged garlic, not with, not, we, we haven't studied general garlic uh, 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 at this point. 
Well, I am really impressed. So the work that you've done with aged garlic may be very specific to that kind of concentration and what you get with the aged garlic. Yes, and, and you know, when, when you uh, cook garlic or when you, you know, there's different ways that you can serve raw garlic. I think some of them may be less effective for the heart. There was one study even that was done up at Stanford that showed that garlic added onto a sandwich every day did not even lower cholesterol. So I think how you prepare it may, may be different. And that's why we, we decided to study the, the, you know, the formulated, measured, active compound in, in aged garlic extract as a supplement to allow people to, uh, you know, have, we know what they were getting on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't dependent on how fresh the garlic was or how big the clove was or any of those other, other factors. So that was a really good reason to choose that because you know that the dosing and the amount of active constituents is going to be the same in something like this, an aged garlic product. Right, and, and it was odorless, so I couldn't smell the patient and say, oh, I know you're on garlic or I know you're on placebo. <laughs> A problem oh, with that's garlic an interesting... research. <laughs> I definitely um, wouldn't have even thought of that. That's, that's a really good point. Um, so uh, is it possible to, to eat enough which is garlic that, you know, someone might put in their food to gain the same benefits? Um, it's probably, uh, yes, I think it's possible, but I think you'd have to have a large amount of garlic. And again, we just don't know how much garlic and how to prepare it to really get that, that consistent benefit that we see. So uh, I think if you're a huge garlic eater, I think that's great. I think for most of us who, you know, don't have, you know, garlic with every meal and don't don't walk around with that garlic odor, um, I think I think considering a, an odorless aged garlic extract um, like this kaolic would be something that would be um, a good alternative. That's really amazing. So when, going back in time a little bit, what made you decide to become a doctor? So yeah, so I. I um, uh, I got um, uh, interested in high school. Uh, uh, my high school uh, teacher in science brought in a cadaver, and we actually, uh, in very proactive back in in the, in the early '80s, um, um, and uh, uh, just and we started doing uh, dissections as a class, and and uh, I kind of got interested in in medicine and science at that point, and then pursued it in college and kept going. Well, we are very fortunate that you did and that, you know, you got into true prevention because you're not saying prevention is just, you know, eat what you want and get a cardiogram every year or two. Right, right. No, I, I incorporate a lot of lifestyle changes, diet, um, um, traditional and conventional medicines for my patients, depending on their needs. And, and I think there's a, a growing group of doctors who are doing that. So I think... Uh, you know, well, the true preventive so. doctor should be more comprehensive than just uh, a few prescriptions and uh, and a follow-up test. You know, and, and then there are all these education opportunities. I know I'm working with various clinics who bring in a lot of their patients for group meetings. And now, of course, they're on Zoom with our current new world um, yep. for true, you know, let's say meeting with a nutritionist because of cardiovascular problems. I mean, that should be part of the intervention because yourself as the physician may not have time to go deeply into healthy dietary changes. Absolutely, I think, I think dietitians are critical. I think most of us are just not up to the task of uh, giving uh, you know, really sage cardi uh, dietary advice. Um, and and you know, there's so many different things that, that, that people can do and from a dietary perspective. But it's also time management. I mean, you know, yep. you need to see a certain number of clients. You might not have time to sit there and go over their diet for half an hour. So, but bringing into practice, into various cardiologists' practices, this concept of having an RD, and in terms of the billing, there is now tele-billing and group billing. So from that point of view, it could be worthwhile too, you know, which is part of the business management. But more importantly, in terms of health management, it could really extend your reach in terms of helping patients, which is what we all got into this field about, usually, most healthcare providers. 
Yep. And it's really sad that it's kind of deteriorated into standing in the corner, looking over your shoulder and typing into a computer to fight, try to find a code. Right. Unfortunately, yeah, no. that's what we're uh, yeah, seeing. I'm not a big fan of the uh, electronic medical record uh, um, uh, world that we live in now where doctors are supposed to write their notes while they're seeing you and paying half attention to you while they're looking up things on the computer. Exactly. It's, it's really just absolutely not not how it should be but i would like to also ask you since we are in the time of covid and garlic is also highly antimicrobial yes yes so there's been a lot of trials uh no, i haven't done them personally but a lot of studies looking at uh, garlic's effect on the bacteria and viruses so i'm not i'm not familiar with, with it's i don't think it's specifically been studied against the coronavirus but over the over the last uh, few decades, it's been studied against many viruses, and it's been shown to decrease uh, viral activity and viral infections. So I, I do prescribe it for my patients who are overly concerned or at high risk of coronavirus um, as another consideration. Yeah, and just the antimicrobial in general. And, right, and right. what I don't know, and perhaps you could share with us, there are some even natural therapies and herbs that you actually like, I'll throw out one, golden seal. Um, I reserve the use of golden seal for a medicinal reason, not something that everyone should take all the time. But, but perhaps that's not true with an aged garlic. Yeah, I think aged garlic has you know pretty broad benefit and uh, therefore I, I do recommend it and, and even as a low dose uh, for people just for a long-term um, care. Uh, um, just uh, has so many, oh, so many benefits. Um, the, uh, but I agree with you. There's certain things like turmeric that I prescribe when patients have inflammation that I don't have them taking all the time um, as a preventive therapy. So how I use turmeric personally is I just use like you would, let's say, in ethnic uh, South Asian cooking. You know, I just use, I have a shaker there and I'm very liberal with it. And yep. then also, when you're talking about, let's say, a turmeric pill, you might be looking at a standardized pill that has a higher amount of an active constituent, such as the curcuminoids, which are known to be anti-inflammatory. Exactly, exactly. So I use the, the tablets um, sporadically, not, not, not every day, whereas garlic, I think, is more of an everyday uh, potential. Well, that's excellent. So... What I'd like you to do, we're going to take a little break right here, again, just so the station can identify itself and tell our listeners how many other shows they can listen to right here on Progressive Radio Network. And please wait around because we have a few more pieces of information, Dr. Budoff, that we would like to share with our listeners. We will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And welcome back once again right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. We're so thankful that you join us every week right here on Progressive Radio Network. Um, there's also a phone number that you can actually call in and listen to any of the shows if any of you, you know, um, aren't, let's say, into the tech thing. But it's just another way to access all the wonderful shows right here on Progressive Radio Network. In addition, today we're so happy to have with us Dr. Matthew Budoff. Dr. Budoff is professor of medicine at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and is a preeminent preventive cardiologist at Harvard UCLA Medical Center. And also his work is widely viewed by other cardiologists all over the world. And hoping very much that he's able to do what he talked to us here about, which is having more non-invasive testing done that is not always done. You can start asking your cardiologist for it. That's a good idea. I do. I actually do, and, and I get it, um, which is an evaluation of calcification in various areas such as around your heart and your carotid glands and your inguinal glands, because isn't it good to know before you go? And that's what um, Dr. Budoff was sharing with us as well. So thank you so much for your work on that, Dr. Budoff. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I, and I apologize. I will have to jump off in a few minutes. Uh, 
uh, in this world of uh, Zoom meetings, I uh, get get booked up. Uh, so, but uh, okay. Well, close, you know what? Yeah. We can let you go now because we have only right. about ten minutes left, and I well, can certainly go ahead and, and share more with the listeners. I appreciate that. I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for having me on, and I hope uh, I hope people derive some information. Uh, they can. Again, as I said before, get more information from kyolic.com, K-Y-O-L-I-C.com. And I, uh, um, they had, there's a lot of information, and a lot of the articles that I've published are, are on that website as well, so they can read more about it. Very good. And thank you for being our guest today, Doctor. Uh, it's a pleasure. You have a great day. So since we're on the topic of heart health and also antimicrobials, I'll share a little bit more information with you. For example... A wonderful herb to add to your heart health regimen is hawthorn. Hawthorn is, it's very interesting because um, it, the berry, which is very similar to a crab apple, if you've ever seen a, a crab apple, is actually, um, is actually something that looks like a little heart. And that's always interesting because there's something in herbal medicine called the doctrine of signatures. So that is one of the things that really, really has also been highly studied in terms of its ability to strengthen the heart. And that is called Hawthorn. Another thing that is really super great for not only um, uplifting the happy heart, but keeping it in great shape is pomegranate. And pomegranate, again, if you think about the doctrine of signatures, the doctrine of signatures, like think about um, a pomegranate and what it looks like. It really looks like a heart. In fact, it's even the same size and shape as a heart. Uh, you know, if you hold it up to your chest and it even has something that looks a lot like um, where the vasculature comes into the heart, you know, the artery right on top. That's another one that is very, very powerful in terms of mimicking, when we look at mimicking the heart. So pomegranate has specifically been studied for its helpful effects for heart health. So either using pomegranate juice or go ahead and buy a pomegranate. I love to eat a fresh pomegranate. It's only available certain times of the year, not all the time. But the problem is it is messy. I know it's messy to eat, so it's not the best thing to eat in company of a lot of people. But basically what I do is I make it a special time, you know, usually not in front of anyone. I'm by myself and just slice, slice the pomegranate chew on those seeds inside and then you have to spit out the little seed inside the berries but you get all that fresh pomegranate juice another very good choice is to purchase unsweetened pomegranate juice it's a little bit sour i like sour but if you don't you can water it down and it's available in every health food store, but now, truthfully, every growth, grocery store. I have found it in every commercial grocery store. Now, there are commercial ones, you know, brand names that are very big. I'm sure you know them. Those tend to add things. I always like to read the ingredients, and I don't like to use a pomegranate juice that has a high fructose corn syrup in it or lots of sugar. There are many unsweetened varieties, and some of them actually even just have apple juice. So that would be another good choice. An other herb that you want to add into your heart healthy regimen is something that I can see outside growing all over the place right here in Florida. <laughs> Not for those of you snowed in today, but you might have them in the summer, and of course you can always get them through health food sources, and that would be hibiscus. Hibiscus, which is in the mallow family, actually has been used traditionally for high blood pressure, circulatory disorders. It acts as a diuretic. That's how it helps the heart as well, um, as well as cooling down the body's temperature. And it's also a good antimicrobial, which is so interesting how many things many of these herbs can be used for. Um, another kind of hibiscus is called roselle. That grows in Florida and in the tropics, and it's also the national flower of Malaysia. 
and it was considered a holy um, a holy herb by the goddess Kali, um, a red hibiscus flower. It's used in offerings, and it is very, very great in terms of heart health. In fact, there was a recent study um, in the Journal of um, Hypertension about the effect of hibiscus on arterial hypertension, a systemic review and meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials. And the conclusion was that there is a strong, significant effect of hibiscus on lowering blood pressure. So that is another reason to incorporate it into your regimen. It has clinical indirect in indications for diabetes, for um, high blood pressure, for high cholesterol, um, for metabolic syndrome. And in addition, this is what's so fantastic about natural remedies, which we don't find in conventional therapeutics, they also often are also antiviral. So in this particular case, hibiscus has been studied for its effects on the herpes virus. Now it has never been studied for its effects on the uh, you know current coronavirus, but still it is antiviral. So it contains flavonoids such as quercetin and hibiscus. Uh, and it also has malic acid and vitamin C. You know, vitamin C is also antiviral and supportive of the immune system. So hibiscus has very strong antioxidant activities, and it reduces the oxidative stress in the vascular system by lowering bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, the low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and also brings down blood pressure. So these things are something to keep in mind along with garlic and aged garlic. Um, hibiscus has been shown that 100 milligrams a day for a month is a preventive treatment for metabolic syndrome. And the outcome showed a significant reduction of blood glucose as well. Bringing down that blood glucose level and insulin release is also directly linked to heart health. So hibiscus, about six grams of dried flowers and 250 milliliters a day of water can be taken as a tea, or you can always buy like a powdered capsule um, such as 100 milligrams a day. Another good thing to consider adding in for its cardiovascular protective effects is in a nutritional supplement known as resveratrol. Now resveratrol is, has very interesting cardiovascular effects because it inhibits platelet aggregation. That's when blood cells stick together. So it causes the blood to be more free flowing. And it's really just an excellent, excellent choice. So we gave you a whole list today and a wonderful guest. Um, he just had to leave us a couple minutes early, but we had a, a phenomenal discussion with Dr. Budoff, who, who of course is a very high level professor of medicine at David. Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and he suggested that you can find out more about the AIDS garlic he discussed at a website called kyolic.com. And on behalf of myself and Dr. Eugene Zamperone, we love you to join with us. We love to hear from you. Go to naturalnurse.com, click on calendar to see all the up and coming classes, or go to Facebook, The Natural Nurse. Either way, send us your feedback, Join the conversation, eat healthy, exercise, stay happy, and until next time, this is on behalf of myself and my wonderful co-host, Dr. Eugene Zamperone, we hope that you stay healthy.